Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. The first and final battles of the Cold War were fought from Wyoming. The 706 strategic missile wing, high on the Wyoming plateau. From 1958 to 2005, Wyoming's firepower grew ever more fierce. It's absolutely essential that we proceed to produce this missile. And this was the most powerful base ever in the United States. It won the Cold War. You take your troubles with you. But maybe I can feel brand new again Across the line Another day on alert begins at F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne. Morning, Crew Force. Morning. I'm Captain Jefferson, your pre-deployment briefing officer this morning. The Air Force's 90th Space Wing at F.E. Warren controls 150 Minuteman III missiles. To find the silos for these ICBMs, just look for the chain-linked squares scattered across southeast Wyoming, western Nebraska, and northern Colorado. Every day, uh, we are trained and we are ready to go to war. We do face a growing WMD threat from countries all over the world. Uh, in the event that something were to happen, and the United States needed a very, very rapid uh, nuclear response. Uh, we can be there in times on the order of 30 minutes. Three, Missileers two, have a saying, one, 30 minutes one. or less, or the next one's free. You know, to be a, to be a missileer, uh, you have the weight of the world's uh, uh, history on your shoulders. Welcome to Juliet One. Uh, I'm your facility manager, Tech Sergeant Keith Thomas. All I ask on the site is that you please observe certain safety protocols. Please don't touch anything without direction from your escort, myself. Uh, there is no smoke. Below ground at F.E. Warren's missile alert facilities, an elevator delivers missileers to the blast door which seals the control capsule. When a new three-person crew of missileers comes on duty for a typical three-day shift, they assume command over 10 launch facilities. We accept the custody of generally 10, um, 10 missiles. And with that custody, we are now in control of specifically those 10 missiles. And we spend many, many, many hours uh, practicing uh, in detail uh, to the nth degree, uh, with accuracy and precision, how you handle emergency war orders and how you will deal with nuclear weapons. We are always watching each other, someone's always watching us. At any time we can monitor any other capsule in our squadron and they're also monitoring us. If any unauthorized act occurs, we would be able to detect that immediately with our alarms and we can either uh, stop those unauthorized actions or if they are authorized we take appropriate actions to uh, continue on with with the commands that were sent. We are the ultimate gatekeepers of the sites. No one gets on or off the site without our permission. From their control panels inside the capsules, the missileer teams command security forces on the ground and in the air. These forces offer an instant reminder that there are more than cows out here on the range. You know, I'd be driving into work and they'd be laying out on the ground with their guns. If someone should ever try to uh, take one of our weapons by force, they better bring a small army because we are ready and lethal. Um, this is the Mark 19 fully automatic grenade launcher. It's just there to be intimidating to the enemy and also use it against the enemy and it's very effective. Security forces at F.E. Warren are dispatched by missileers whenever alarms are tripped at the launch facilities. Each LF is monitored by a large white Doppler radar antenna. The antenna is so sensitive, tumbleweeds or jackrabbits can trigger an alarm as easily as an armed intruder. We're more of a reactive force. We react to anything that happens, if anything was to happen on site. Make sure nothing fishy is going on out here. Missiles and their components are routinely pulled for upgrades and maintenance 
while armed troops stand guard and missileers observe all activity from the capsule. Monitoring and maintenance. These are a missileer's day-to-day -day duties during four-year tours on alert. They function a little like air traffic controllers at airports, where nothing is supposed to leave the ground. Heaven forbid, if the capsule did receive a launch command, these missileers know the drill. We receive a message on our higher authority side here, and we have ways of being able to tell if the message is an original one or not. Um, and once we've determined whether or not this message is a good one, then we can react by opening up our container that has values in it that lets us know whether or not the message is good. The president has the authority to direct the use of nuclear weapons, and he's the only one who can direct the use of, of these weapons. If the orders came in, uh, they would be decoded by the crew. Then there is a set of sealed authenticators that no one has seen, which verify that those orders come from uh, the National Command Authority. Upon determination that the orders are good, uh, the crew would take a series of actions uh, required to actually launch the missiles, which includes the uh, proverbial key turn. Successful enable. Hands on keys. Cross check. Looks good. Three, two, one, turn. Holding for ELC. I see it, release. Wait for positive launch indications. And I see missile away. Got missile away. Positive launch indications. A few minutes later, on the order of five minutes later, the missile has left the atmosphere. Uh, 30 minutes after launch, the reentry vehicle re-enters the atmosphere over the target, and uh, we have delivered the weapon. There is no margin of error uh, in, uh, in dealing with nuclear weapons. You can't let one go and say, oops, my bad. So yes, I guess it is an awesome responsibility, but it's one that we've been trained to do since day one, so it's kind of, just automatic now, it's natural. It doesn't necessarily seem to me like an awesome responsibility, it just seems like my job. Before the rolling range outside Cheyenne became missile country, it was free land, up for the taking by immigrants like the Kirkbrides. Well, they, they came from Northern England and uh, I guess poverty was the thing that they had there, and the hope was the thing they had here. The Kirkbride family homesteaded in 1889, and so they came here um, because of the lure of the land. The Kirkbride family thrived on its lush, isolated ranch. Then, at the start of World War II, Ken Kirkbride was pulled away from the Wyoming prairie and into the fight. My father-in-law is a hero. You know, it was estimated that the cost of actually taking Japan was go could be, we could have 500,000 casualties. So for Ken Kirkbride and his fellow soldiers, the dawn of the nuclear age came as a welcome surprise. Everybody felt pretty good about it. There wasn't any tears and, uh, about and feeling sorry for the Japanese. The legacy of the nuclear strike on Japan would eventually follow Kirkbride back to his family's ranch. The Cold War was on with the Soviets' unveiling of a 57 megaton hydrogen bomb. By this act, the Soviet Union have added injury to insult. They have started a new race for more deadly weapons. In 1955, President Eisenhower responded by pushing for the rapid deployment of an entirely new kind of weapon the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Three, two, one, zero. The Air Force was racing to perfect its first generation of nuclear missiles and to find a place to base these ICBMs. Two things came into play. A, totally central to the United States for protection, and then number two is uh, range to the targets. F.E. Warren Air Force Base had both. It was difficult for the enemy to strike, and Wyoming's northern latitude put Soviet targets at risk thanks to the newly developed Atlas missile, which could be fired over the northern hemisphere. Its significance is that it's the first really true intercontinental ballistic missile, and in 1958, uh, the first uh, 
construction began to actually base the Atlas D model missile uh, here at Warren Air Force Base. It was a bucket of worms. It was a lot of confusion. They were people go on strike. They had three different states to work in. Uh, something you, nor you wouldn't want to get into if you knew what you were looking at. While the contractors struggled to clear construction hurdles, ranchers around Cheyenne grew accustomed to hosting missiles on their land. Here's a highly technical system going out to a, a, a ranch land and all of a sudden it's cordoned off, drilling, a lot of concrete, uh, a lot of operations, uh, probably a lot of secrecy at the same time. had to actually pull it upright and in the gantry and pull it upright, gas it up. It took him about an hour to actually do that process. It looked strange because it wasn't a ranch house. It wasn't something that we would normally have seen on the prairie. Cheyenne was very much a military at that time. At base headquarters at Warren Air Force Base, the ominous red telephone waits in the command post. It became more and more evident that you know, there is a real issue here and we hear new missiles going in all the time and there was a very large complex in place. And we see more and more uh, Air Force trucks running around maintaining these things and it was, you really realized that it was not uh, the wild, wild west of the traditional cowboys and Indians. We were at a different age at that time. You know, since I was from here, growing up in school, there was an impact to us at school. We always had those duck and cover practices um, where you ducked underneath your desk and covered your head as much as possible. And Bert the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover. Ducked and cover. Ducked and cover. Ducked and cover. If we superimpose the uh, known pattern of atomic destruction on the city, uh, we get a very graphic idea of the uh, scope of the damage. It's not a pretty picture, nor one we can afford to ignore. That was especially true during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when new parts of the world became fronts in the Cold War, the tropical jungles of Cuba and the high plains outside Cheyenne. In 1962, the United States and the Soviet Union stand on the verge of direct military confrontation during one week in October. Had President Kennedy given the order uh, to actually launch an attack, part of that attack would have come from right here in Cheyenne, Wyoming at F.E. Warren Air Force Base. There's one straight south of me and there's one on the way to Laramie and there's one on the way to Chugwater. But I can remember going down the road and looking over at the missile site and the, or and the yellow light was on, waiting, waiting to shoot something off. It's actually in some respects more frightening now to read how close we may have come to the ultimate uh, standoff with the Russians. Uh, I think that perhaps the Cuban Missile Crisis can be looked at as an incentive to go to a more efficient uh, solid fuel system and, and I think that uh, drove in great measure the decision to get rid of the Atlas uh, as an active weapon system and to replace it with the Minuteman One. Well really it was uh, both firepower as well as safety. Uh, the Atlas was a liquid launch system, Minuteman was a solid launch, so very, very, you know, degrees uh, safer of operation and more accurate and more reliable. The decision to base the Minuteman uh, missile here at Warren Air Force Base involved a, a huge amount of work and construction because uh, they were going from essentially 24 Atlas missiles under the control of Warren Air Force Base to 200 Minuteman missiles. To do that required thousands of contractors who came to Cheyenne so that as a result you have a, a huge web of interconnecting 
communication cables and and uh, pneumatic hoses and whatnot, all to to tie uh, this uh, missile field together. Cheyenne benefited from the Minuteman construction boom and the growing influx of highly trained Air Force personnel. And as the Minuteman I evolved into the Minuteman III, the city evolved right alongside the base. It's uh, one of the best, I believe, uh, examples of uh, integration. There is not this town versus military, which does exist in many other places. It does not exist here. While the Vietnam War drew protesters onto the streets of Cheyenne, F.E. Warren's nuclear mission attracted little attention. A decade later, that would change. It was the 1980s, morning in America, as President Reagan liked to say, and missile culture was crossing over into pop culture. Shall we play a game? How about global thermonuclear war? <laughs> BMUs has continuous radar tracking on inbound. While the nation fixed on war games, frontier days remained Cheyenne's focus and claim to fame. But newer, more powerful missile technology was about to separate F.E. Warren from other Air Force bases and make it the daddy of them all. We must replace and modernize our forces. And that's why I've decided to proceed with the production and deployment of the new ICBM known as the MX. The MX, or Peacekeeper as it became known, carried 10 warheads, an advanced guidance system, and more political baggage than any other ICBM. Well, the government is dead wrong. We believe that uh, if you took uh, all the weapons in, uh, in World War II, including Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, they don't equal one weapon that a Peacekeeper carries. Reagan planned to build these weapons in bulk, 100 missiles carrying 1,000 total weapons or warheads. While a national debate over the MX escalated, it became clear that Cheyenne was on the short list of possible deployment sites for the new missile system. As David Dow reports from Cheyenne, some in Wyoming think putting the missiles there will make dollars and cents. Many in Wyoming speculate that the sprawling plains northwest of Cheyenne will be the ultimate home for the 100-missile MX Dense Pack. A Dense Pack missile facility with all the weapons housed in a single location was one option. Another included mounting the missiles on mobile rail cars. Both appealed to Cheyenne locals who figured that what was good for F.E. Warren was good for the city. We're a company town. The military is the company. The Cheyenne community has become a, a sort of a junkie for military projects. The Wyoming site offers one obvious plus to Air Force planners. Wyoming's voters are represented by Republicans in Washington, all MX supporters. And business and construction interests have in the past supported the MX. Well, I think it'd be great for our state. I think we could use the income and the revenue off of it, put a lot of people to work. On November 22nd, 1982, Televisions in Cheyenne were tuned into President Reagan's much-anticipated announcement about the future of the Peacekeeper. It's absolutely essential that we proceed to produce this missile and that we base it in a series of closely based silos at Warren Air Force Base near Cheyenne, Wyoming. State and local officials had this to say about Reagan's announcement. And in this particular case, I am unwilling to suggest that my judgment in military defense matters is superior to or should be substituted for that of the President and the Congress. There is a collision course between the, the superpowers that could ultimately lead to a nuclear holocaust. Mayor Erickson feels the MX missiles may be used as bargaining power with the Soviets in their arms reduction talks. Therefore, he's hopeful that the weapons will never have to be built. 23 religious leaders of different Christian denominations converged in Cheyenne today. They held a press conference this morning at St. Paul's Lutheran Church to publicly denounce the MX missile. In Cheyenne, there was a widening gap between the critics and supporters of F.E. Warren's missile command. I came down to protest the protesters. And I believe that Wyoming or Cheyenne should have the MX because we already have the Minuteman 3s. This is the cheapest way to base the system. 
As the peacekeeper evolved, the Air Force scrapped plans to construct a so-called dense pack facility or rail garrison. Instead, the missiles would be housed in existing Minuteman III sites, like those on the Kirkbride Ranch. I remember we were pushing the cattle past um, a missile site, and I said, I asked my father-in-law what he thought about these missile sites being on our ranch. And he said, well, it's like a game of poker. You gotta keep your cards pretty close to your chest, and you gotta, you know, you gotta always have something up your sleeve. <laughs> Well, I think that's, I think that's what it was. You're in the poker game, you know, it's, a lot of this world is what people think. If they knew we had it, uh, that it was, uh, would be a great deterrent. Most residents in Cheyenne shared this opinion, but Cheyenne's activist community continued to organize. They made art, gathered for rallies, and wrote protest songs. I've got a good friend who sleeps in the silos and dreams about turning the key. But I've seen him chug tequila all night. He seems all right to me. Lindy Kirkbride emerged as a leader among local activists and bore the brunt of media scrutiny. And I feel that, in a way, if the press isn't lying about us, they're ignoring us. In 1986, anti-nuclear demonstrators held a funeral procession out to one of F.E. Warren's missile sites. After this well-attended protest, excitement over the MX started to die down, and the Air Force scaled back. Instead of 100, 50 peacekeepers went on alert at F.E. Warren, and the economic boom some predicted never materialized. They thought this town was going to become, we'd have 100,000 people yeah, overnight. Right. Everybody was going to get rich. Wyoming still became home to the most powerful missile base in the world. And one of the base's former commanders was charged with teaching President Reagan how to fight a global thermonuclear war. Uh, and then I was uh, asked to go teach uh, President Reagan the uh, war plan because uh, I really devoted myself to know absolutely everything you possibly could know about every weapon system the United States had, the theory of war, war winning, and uh, the uh, target system. The part of that system, under the command of F.E. Warren, ultimately had the power to hit hundreds of Soviet targets. Of course, the Soviets returned the favor by targeting Cheyenne. You know, we knew that we were part of the hit list. We were up in the top three, and especially when it was announced on 60 Minutes and the Russian were asked where the missile was pointed that they were standing next to. This particular SS-17 missile is targeted on Warren Air Force Base, Cheyenne, Wyoming. The ICBM standoff continued at F.E. Warren, even after Air Force missileers claimed victory in the Cold War. Mr. Gorbachev, Tear down this wall. Peacekeeper is what won the Cold War. I mean, it was the big nail in the coffin. Okay, Atlas to Minuteman to uh, uh, Peacekeeper, you can see uh, uh, incremental steps with more accuracy, more reliability, more safety, more capabilities. And I believe the Russians eventually figured they can't compete. Everybody wins when we step away from the, from the edge of uh, nuclear war. So here in Wyoming, you have the home of the peacekeeper, which was critical in the winning of the Cold War. And yet, how do you walk away from the Cold War to the New World Order? And one of the first steps that the United States pursued was disarming that very weapon that won that war. All I had seen was the build up. And then now I've seen them take it out. That was an amazing piece for me, and to see that um, that we really, we did have a critical role here, and they, the Russians did come in to, to F.E. Warren and inspect, and we have gone over there and inspected, and we do live in a society that there's some accountability here, um, and thank God for that.
What do I see for the future of Epi Warren? This is the ultimate backstop that gives that diplomatic mission that we have wherever it is, anywhere in the world, that we have the ultimate power that we can destroy you or we can defend ourselves. I love everything about the military. I mean, from the uniform that I wear to going out there and protecting the country that everybody lives in for freedom. So make sure you get your A game out there today. That's all I got. Carry on. We have so many fail safes in place that I don't believe anything would go wrong. In, in this world that we're living in now, with, uh, where we're fighting a global war on terror, and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan really have center stage in, in, the, in the, the battles that we're fighting over there. The, the missiles in Wyoming are still relevant. That gives the President of the United States the, the ability to send troops abroad and knowing that the homeland is secured and defended. Well, our role is to keep other nations that have intercontinental ballistic missiles from launching them against us. And, and there, are, there are a growing number of those countries around the world. Uh, and the proliferation of, of missile technology is only going to increase that capability. It is a different world now. And um, I think that the political will to, to change the missile systems from, the, um, from what we've had, I don't think we uh, want to do it the way we have been doing it. There is a case to be made that fewer weapons would be good, no weapons would be good, uh, the weapons exist. We have the weapons and other people have the weapons. The fact that we have the weapons may deter other people from using the weapons. That's really the bottom line in my opinion. Sunset, a light up the mountains, throw fire on the valley below. There's an eerie light shining on the silo at the end of Atlas Road. Having long since ended its vigil, the minute meant miles away. Now peacekeepers come in to stand the watch Makes me feel real safe I've got a good friend who sleeps in the silos And dreams about turning the key This lady called up and, you know, answered the phone and she said, Are you the missile lady? <laughs> I said, well... I guess that would be me. I have been known to have my opinions about the missile. <laughs> so um, anyway, she just, she was pretty drunk and she just had to let me know that, that, you know, I better be careful what I was saying. 